Hello. This is the second lecture uh, regarding ultrasound transducers and beam forming concepts. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about what the ultrasound beam shape looks like. Firstly, for unfocused ultrasound beams, and then we'll talk about ways that we can try and focus the beam to try and improve the resolution of the image. And we'll talk about the ways that different types of transducer use, uh, use the ultrasound crystals to try and focus the beam. So first of all, let's consider the ultrasound beam which is unfocused, as it's probably easiest to understand. On the left of the screen, you'll see the ultrasound uh, aperture, or the ultrasound crystals, uh, the aperture or the diameter of the, uh, of the crystals sending out a sound wave. And you'll notice that we've got a near field, which is also known as the Fresnel zone, and then we've got a far field, which is also known as the Fraunhofer zone. This is also can be described as the divergent area, whereas you'll see that in the, in the near field, there will be a transition point as we move into the far field, and from there, that's where the ultrasound beam then diverges. Depending on the aperture, we can then try and determine what the near field length is, and we can also try and understand what the far field divergence is. And the most important thing to try and understand is that in order to focus the ultrasound beam, we can only do that in the near field. So that's why it becomes very important to try and know the length of this, because that's the area that we're going to be able to improve our resolution when we actually get down to focusing. There are a couple of equations to remember. They like to bring them up in the exams, of course. The first of all is in terms of the length of the near field. And that is going to be aperture squared divided by 4 times the wavelength. So we'll see that the length of the near field is proportional to the aperture, and it's inversely proportional to the wavelength. In terms of far field divergence, we measure that as the angle theta. And that is equal to the sine of 1.22 times the wavelength divided by the aperture. So we can see from this that theta is proportional to the wavelength and inversely proportional to the aperture. So let's ask a couple of questions. So first of all, how is the near field lengthened? And secondly, what are the trade-offs of this? Well, as we just discussed, the length of the near field is related to aperture squared divided by 4 times the wavelength. So therefore, to lengthen the near field, we can increase the frequency or increase the size of the transducer. But what are the trade-offs of doing this? Well, I hope you'll now start to have that knee-jerk reaction that whenever anyone says increased frequency, we know that we are reducing our penetration because of increased attenuation. If we increase the size of the transducer, it makes sense, that especially if you think of something like echocardiography, for example. We've only got a limited amount of space to try and get in between the, in between the ribs. And so we're going to have to limit the size of our transducer to a certain extent. So now let's consider trying to focus this ultrasound beam a bit more. And this is going to happen in what's known as the focal point or the focal zone. And this is the depth where both the intensity is greatest and the beam is the narrowest. And this will give us some of the best resolution possible. It's actually, rather than a single depth, it's more of a focal zone. And again, it is only possible to get this focal zone in the near field. Both the axial and the lateral resolution is going to be best where the beam is at the narrowest. But we have to consider that we're going to get increased beam divergence as we, uh, as we go into the far field if we increase up the zone of focus. And that's tried to explain it in that sort of the higher of the two diagrams there, where the focal zone is longer for the transducer in the red versus 
the transducer in the blue, which has a smaller beam width, so it's going to have better, re better lateral resolution. However, we're going to get greater beam divergence happening in the far field. Another important equation to remember is the beam width at the focus, which is equal to 2.44 times the wavelength times the depth of focus divided by the aperture. And again, it's probably important just to remember that the beam width at the focus is proportional both to the wavelength, the depth of the focus, and it's inversely proportional to the aperture. Another way of potentially thinking that is the narrowest beam is achieved by the highest possible frequency. In terms of trying to focus the ultrasound beam further, there are two predominant ways that we can look at doing this. One is by mechanical means, which is through the use of a curved probe directing the ultrasound waves down towards the focal point, or more commonly also using a lens. The second way is using uh, electrical methods, which is where you can stimulate different portions of the ultrasound transducer crystals and you can get them to fire off their wave at a different time, directing the, directing the ultrasound waves down through in, in a similar to sort of a curved format. And we'll discuss this a little bit more. So electrical focus is performed by what's known as arrays. Uh, and, and ultrasounds or crystal arrays are basically where you just take the ultrasound crystal bar and you make lots of parallel cuts in the transducer material. You make these cuts halfway through, and then these cuts are filled with an insulating material. And essentially, you end up with very, very narrow, what we know as transducer elements, which is each sort of individual bar. And each of these elements can operate as a single, separate transducer. In a linear array or a curved array probe, which you can see in the top of those two probes seen here, these cuts, are apparently about, these cuts are approximately 0.3 of a millimeter apart. And that gives you about 256 elements, which is a standard number across most sort of linear or curvilinear probes. In the phased array probes, you get approximately 64 or 128 or even 256 in some of the newer probes. And this is because you've got a smaller footprint and all of the phased array, and all of the phased array uh, elements are firing at the same time. But we use a smaller footprint. What we can see is, and we're going to consider the, the phased array probes first, because I said these use all the elements, and it's probably it's a little easier to understand to begin with. So with electrical focusing, the processing unit sends out a an array of, or sends out a barrage of electrical signals. We then have variable delays that are brought about in terms of how quickly those electrical signals actually hit the ultrasound transducer elements. And if we have a delay that's greatest for the elements that are at the center of the probe, that means that the electrical signal, the electrical signal will hit the elements of the outer, uh, the outer array first. And that will, f that will mean that we will get a sort of directional component to the way that the ultrasound, the main ultrasound wave, uh, sound wave front goes forward. As well as focusing it, we can actually try and steer the image as well. And this is how we make up the entire image of the uh, of phased array image or the uh, echo probe. The phased array steers sequentially in a number of different directions. And this means that instead of uh, this means that where you can have the, instead of the sensor portions being, uh, being activated uh, after the outer portions, we can make it so that one side of the uh, array is stimulated first before another side, and so you get beam steering happening. If we can try and uh, sort out the delays so that we get a bit of both happening, we can both steer and focus, as can be seen in the bottom part of that, uh, bottom part of that image. With a phased array probe, you've approximately got a 90 degree uh, angle that we're trying to image at. And this means that we, can, we have between each 
between each ultrasound pulse, we can get one degree change in the direction with each sweep. And this means that we need approximately so 90 transmit pulses to acquire the information for a single image. As well as transmitting ultrasounds, of course, we've got to receive them as well. And we get a form of focusing that happens with these received uh, signals as well. And this is called dynamic focusing. And this is much more of an automatic process than the transmission. With the transmission, you remember that you can set where you're going to want the focal zone to be. With the reception of these probes, the machine does this automatically. And it can compensate for the delay in these returning echoes because it knows what depth the echoes are coming from based on timing. And then it can look at trying to delay the reception from the inner to the outer accordingly. In addition to this dynamic focusing, there will also be a dynamic aperture where the machine will uh, choose the number of elements depending on the depth. And this is all about trying to give you the best image possible. Finally, just to talk about the difference between the phased array versus the linear and the curved probes. So these linear and curved probes are, they're they not doing any steering with their elements or their array. All their beams are going to be parallel to the uh, direction of the uh, ultrasound probe surface. What they're doing with these linear and curved probes is that they are using subsets of elements in turn to kind of step through the array to try and form a to try and form the the image. And you can get focusing happening at uh, you can choose again the depth of the focus that you are going to be choosing based on that. So in summary. The ultrasound beam is going to have a near field and a far field. Focusing can only happen in the near field, and that is dependent on frequency and aperture. In the focal zone, if we, if, if we look at just the focal zone, this is where the resolution and the intensity is going to be the best. Lateral resolution is best in the focal zone, as is axial resolution. But axial resolution is normally better than lateral resolution. Further focusing can occur with mechanical means, so that's using a curved probe or a lens, or with electrical means, where we get delays in different portions or different elements which are, can be stimulated at different times to other elements. As well as the transmitted echoes, we will also be considering the received echoes. And the received echoes can also be delayed in terms of their electrical impulses so that we can try and, uh, we can try and focus the reception of the echoes as well. And finally, just consider the difference between phased array versus linear and curved array probes in that the phased array fires all their elements off in one block albeit with delays happening. And we can get both focusing and steering happening from that regard. As opposed to linear and curved array probes, which use predominantly focusing rather than steering uh, to form their sort of B mode and M mode imaging. Steering can occur with these curved and linear array probes, but we typically use it for more of the uh, pulsed wave Doppler uh, side of things. So that's it for the second lecture about the ultrasound and beam forming concepts. Uh, I hope it was useful. Thank you very much.